go step back to the federal legislation, it's for the object, and it doesn't really matter what that object is. Um, New Jersey has essentially a total ban, with, well, it has a total ban with four exceptions. Uh, the ivory can be passed through inheritance, uh, law, law enforcement activity, uh, authorization for federal license or permit, and uh, bona fide educational scientific purposes. So there's zero antique exemptions in the New Jersey law. California has an exemption for musical instruments specifically. And Washington State, I believe, has the exemptions for uh, hunting knives and weapons. Uh, and so, you know, we can start to kind of look at all these different categories. Uh, in the federal law, there's also a de minimis a, a quantity of ivory that's regulated. Um, and so, it, within New England states, um, there's no, currently there's no laws within New England, but the four states have proposed legislation, legislation pending, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Connecticut. And the Connecticut one that we're working on has exemptions for musical instruments uh, before 1976. So it's kind of interesting as we look at each other, uh, the instrument people interested in instruments and the antique dealers, and we, our stuff has to be over 100 years old. Their stuff only has to be before 1976. And it's like, well, does that make sense? How do they get the exemption for 1976? And how come we have to have stuff over 100 years old? So, a lot of it is politics and lobby. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody listens to music. So they have a stronger lobby than the people who collect miniature portraits on ivory or things like that. So when they go up to the Capitol, they have a more votes. That's what it comes down to. And actually, um, when we spoke, it's, it's pretty obvious to some party line. The Democrats are the ones who are proposing more stringent rules and regulations to save the elephants. The Republicans tend to be pro-business and tend to be on the side of, of more lax regulations. Although they're in favor of regulations, they may not be as stringent. But it's very obvious that it is down party lines. And, uh, and so, and as I mentioned, Connecticut has a law in the legislature right now, uh, House Bill 5394. And if, before you go, if you want to get onto our email list, um, I have a special list for people interested in ivory, so it doesn't go to all our customers, and it only comes when there's something happening on the bill. Right now, there's nothing happening. As I'm sure you all know, we have bigger fish to fry in the state of Connecticut. Um, but also, and this is kind of my closing statement, give credit where credit's due. I'm definitely a muckraker. I send out these emails, I try to get uh, people involved and educated and informed. I feel very strongly about the protection of antiques and art uh, that are qualified, that are genuine, and that we cannot regulate something as important as our history. Um, but really, the credit for the uh, five years that, or the four previous years that we've protected the state from unreasonable law goes to the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the Connecticut Historical Society, and the Slater Museum, and then just, and this year, uh, we finally got the Yale University Art Gallery on our side. The, all these institutions have complete exemption from the law. They, it doesn't matter, they can buy, well they can't sell, but they can buy ivory anywhere they want. Um, they can do, and I will sell it too, they have complete exemption from the law. But they understand, and I give a lot of credit to these curators and museum directors that understand and really stood up and said, it's not just our institution, it's the legal trade in ivory that we need to protect. Their collections come from the public. They're, that's how they acquire things. And if a law unnecessarily bans ivory and these restrictions become too great, then it will lose its value, uh, neglect, you know, destruction. Our history and parts of our history will be lost. 
So, uh, so it's definitely uh, support and thank those institutions um, for helping us in this uh, journey. And that was a very difficult thing for them to do because if their donors, uh, especially their big donors, are pro elephant, the last thing they want to do is upset their donors. So they were trying to, in the beginning, for the first couple of years, they were playing both sides of the fence. They really are afraid that they were going to antagonize their big collectors, their big donors. And so they finally came around and realized that the objects are the most important thing to preserve. And really, and I like to say too, the preservation of our history and the protection of elephants in Africa today are not in conflict. They're, they're really not. Um, the poaching and the illegal destruction of those elephants that's been going on you know, clearly since 2000, 2007, when that big increase started, has nothing to do with the preservation of genuine antiques that can be appraised and documented as genuine antiques. Um, and so that, you know, I think that's a really important distinction. We are pro-elephant too. We definitely don't want to see the elephants go extinct, uh, but we just feel that our trade in antique ivory needs to be protected and it's not contributing to that. Uh,